A very warm welcome to followers of the way this morning. It's good to see you all. Well, as we continue our series looking at the letters, the seven churches in Revelation, today we've come to the fourth church, Thyatira. And Philip is going to be speaking to us shortly on confronting Jezebel. Now, Jezebel, as I think we probably all know, was the wife of King Ahab in the Old Testament. She was a Phoenician princess and she worshipped Baal. Foreign idols, in other words. There's an awful lot of that around today, isn't there? But Jezebel, um, she had a reputation for sexual promiscuity and complete ruthlessness. She was a killer who slaughtered the prophets and she was challenged by Elijah. And eventually she came to a very sticky end. Well, today we sometimes talk about a Jezebel spirit. What's meant by that can differ, of course, but very broadly, it indicates a demonic spirit that's operating through deception and seduction. And typically, it's a spirit that's held responsible for rifts in the church and in marriages. It's not nice, and it can be very hard to pin down and very hard to confront. Well, today, I think we'd all agree that we're seeing a rise of evil in the world in general. Completely across the globe, we're seeing it in Israel, seeing it in Ukraine, we're seeing it here in our own country. And let's be honest, it can be frightening and it can be very demoralising. But what we need to remember is that all that's happening now is the fulfilment of scripture. And throughout everything, God calls us to trust and not to be cowed by what's going on. Because whatever we're encountering today, whatever lies ahead, God is with us. So as we start our worship and commit it to the Lord, let's begin with the verse from Haggai, chapter 2, verse 4. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. My spirit abides among you, so do not fear. So trusting in that, let us now commit ourselves and our worship to the Lord. Father God, we come before you now. Lord, in awe at your majesty, you are sovereign, Lord. And you are working for our redemption, for the redemption of the whole of creation. We praise, we thank you for that. And Lord, we commit our time together now into your hands. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will be with us in power, that you will speak to our hearts and minds, that you will lead us in the way that you wish us to go, that you will build us up in strength, that whatever may lie before us now in this world. We may stand in your strength, knowing that you are with us and glorifying your name in all we say and do. So, Lord, please be with us now to your praise and glory and in the name of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the life. Amen. So now I'm going to invite Kate to lead us in our worship. I want 
Thank you, Kate. Kate's second song, Purify My Heart. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. We know that we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. But we also know that we are not perfect. And it is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit, one of his works, to actually conform us to Christ, to, to make us fully what God intends us to be. And so we do need those times just coming before the Lord and just confessing to him, well, we know that we've fallen short. And also we know that there are ways that we've fallen short that we don't know about. Again, we need to bring this to the Lord so that we stand before him and just say, Lord, have your way. Make me holy that I might serve you. So now we're just going to take a moment to just come before the Lord and just offer to him, well, we know that we've fallen short this week. And then we will say this confession together.
So we say together, most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way. We have done wrong and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit, that we may live as disciples of Christ. And this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And as we make our confession, we know that the Lord's love just engulfs us and that he does forgive us and leads us. So we have confidence in saying, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen indeed. So now I invite Lynn to come and give us our reading this morning. Lynn. Today's reading is Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress, unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations to rule them with iron rod, as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my father. To the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. And as Philip comes to uh, uh, open that word to us, let's just commit him to the Lord. We just lift up Philip to you now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will breathe your word into him. Lord, even if it takes him by surprise, Lord, just make him now a channel for what you have to say to us this day and open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, Lord, that we might be challenged by you and might truly become your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. This is the fourth in our sermon series on the letters to the seven churches in Revelation, looking this time at the church in Thyatira. That city still exists, known by its modern Turkish name of Akisa. And though the church there is long gone, the words Jesus spoke to it resonate down the centuries full of meaning and challenge to us today. Writing to these early believers, Jesus calls himself 
the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. He is the incarnation of God himself, full of holiness, righteousness, justice and power. A God who is jealous for his name, for his reputation, and who wants the church that bears his name to represent faithfully who he is. Jesus starts with encouragement and a commendation. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. This is a church with a huge amount going for it. So much so, Jesus tells them they need only hold on to what you have until I come. Just imagine Jesus saying to you that you're doing such a good job, all you need to do is carry on the way you're going. And that statement is even more striking if we contrast it with what Jesus says in the immediately following letter written to the church in Sardis. That's a church clinging by its fingernails to the last vestiges of what it once had. And so Jesus admonishes them, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. The church in Thyatira was totally different. This Thyatira church was alive and on the up. And yet there was a major problem at Thyatira. The enemy had found a way in, bringing his trademarks of division, dissent, doubt, deceit, false doctrine and temptation. And so Jesus warns them, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. When Jesus speaks those words, it is not a metaphor. A real person in the historical city of Thyatira was teaching Satan's so-called deep secrets and leading many people astray. We don't know this person's name, but Jesus characterizes her as a Jezebel, a reference to the wife of Ahab, the wicked king of the northern Israelite kingdom of Israel, whose reign is described in the books of First and Second Kings. This reference to Jezebel is the only time we hear Jezebel spoken about by name in the New Testament, but it's a name that carries a deep resonance with Israel's history. It harks back to the days of Elijah, the great prophet who stood alone on Mount Carmel to face down the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and who centuries later appeared with Moses alongside Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. There's been an awful lot of speculation about exactly what was going on and being taught at Thyatira, and you'll find plenty on the internet about that if you want to read into it. But what we're going to focus on today is a different aspect of this scripture. We're going to look at what it tells us about prayer warfare in our own time and place, about the spiritual principality we call Jezebel, and how to confront this demonic entity. When we talk about Jezebel in the context of prayer warfare, we have to be clear right at the start that it is not Jezebel the wife of Ahab we mean. She's long dead. Second Kings tells us that when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet and her hands. Her spirit has since returned to God who gave it, as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12. Instead, 
The present day Jezebel is a counterfeit spirit that goes by this name. And it was this counterfeit spirit of Jezebel that was at work through a woman in Thyatira, causing her to manifest character traits and behavior that were present in Ahab's wife. Now, let's just be absolutely clear about this right at the start. A Jezebel spirit can manifest in and operate through both men and women. It's not confined to women, but we need to understand it's a powerful principality and not to be trifled with. We'll speak about that more in just a moment or two. But before we get to that, we need to explore what the Bible tells us about the historical character of Jezebel, because that will tell us what sort of things to expect from the demonic entity that goes by this name. Jezebel means, where is the prince or where is Baal? As Linda said, she was a Phoenician princess, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. You know, Jezebel was a class act. She had pedigree. It's likely that she came across very well. This is me reading between the lines, but my guess is that she was educated, attractive, accomplished, and charming. She was certainly persuasive because under her influence, First Kings tells us that Ahab began to serve Baal and worship him. The counterfeit Jezebel similarly often comes in a pleasant guise and with honeyed words wrapped in a nice package. Jezebel's influence over Ahab had bad results for him, but also for Israel as a nation. Baal worship was prevalent in the area to the north, and Ahab's marriage to Jezebel provided an entry point for this cult and for the cult of Baal's consort, the goddess Asherah. We read that Ahab set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in his capital city, Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel before him. Ultimately, Jezebel, the demonic principality, is not content with just influencing the lives of individuals. She seeks influence over institutions, churches, cities, and even nations. You know, I guess that in the days that Ahab lived, his marriage to a Phoenician princess would have seemed like a diplomatic triumph, a culmination of the close ties that had built between Israel and Sidon in the reign of Ahab's father and predecessor as king, Omri. It would have looked like a way to secure Israel's northern border, that route being one of the main invasion routes over the centuries. It was the direction from which, in the years to come, God would bring the Assyrians to put a brutal end to the northern Israelite kingdom's existence. The spirit of Jezebel tries to get us to move in human reasoning, leaving the one true God out of the equation. Jezebel is cunning and manipulative. She prefers to operate behind the scenes where she can, using her influence over key individuals to control the levers of power at second remove. Like Ahab's wife, she'll use pillow talk, or its equivalent, to gain inside knowledge and access to state secrets. We're told that when Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, she was privy to state secrets. She'll try to use the role of proper decision makers. And so having heard from Ahab what Elijah had done, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with a threatening letter. 
If anybody was going to do that, it should have been the king. But Jezebel was the one to step in and take the decision-making role. Jezebel will exploit weak points in personalities to promote her agenda. Later, she taunted Ahab over his failure to get what he wanted, saying, is this how you act as king over Israel? And then she turned on a sixpence, promising to fulfill his desires. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, she promised. Jezre uh, Jezebel wants to take people away from God and cause them to become prisoners of dark forces. First Kings tells us there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by his wife Jezebel. Ahab was enslaved by sin and hence by Satan, and Jezebel was cheering him on from the sidelines. Jezebel hates the one true God, God's people, and God's word. She will do everything she can to stamp out a godly witness and the preaching of the gospel. She especially wants to silence any prophetic voices and to kill true prophecy. So we read that Ahab's wife began systematically killing off the Lord's prophets so that even many of those who survived had to take refuge in a cave. When God, through Elijah, appointed Jehu to be king over Israel, he said, I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. Where Jezebel's spirit is, there will be attempts to kill, silence, sideline, or imprison the word of God and those who speak it, both those who tell out the word and those who foretell. Not content with attacking the genuine version, Jezebel wants to promote false prophecy. To pursue this program, she will co-opt the resources of the state. And so during Ahab's reign, there were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who ate at Jezebel's table. State subsidies were given to these pagan idol worshippers. Jezebel will look to feed false prophecy and promote the worship of false gods. Under Jezebel, the Bible says idolatry and witchcraft abound. When we look at the word witchcraft in the Bible, we see that it's linked with interpreting omens, sorcery and divination, prostitution and idolatry. It encompasses any attempt to control people's actions without their knowledge. It is demonic and there is no good or white form of it. As we look around our own nation today, we see obvious manifestations of witchcraft in many different guises, but there are many less commonly understood manifestations of it as well. The Bible tells us that rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Rebelliousness and arrogance can be clues to the spirit of Jezebel at work every bit as much as tarot, yoga, crystals, and all the rest of it. Jezebel often comes as a seductress. Second Kings says that when Jezebel heard about how Jehu killed Ahab, she painted her eyes, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. No doubt part of that was just putting a brave face on it. But probably there was also a glimmer of hope that she could use her charms on Jehu. That was not to be because Jehu 
told the men with him to throw her down, and she fell to her death from an upstairs window. Now, all of that is background to understanding the nature of the satanic principality called Jezebel that was at work in Thyatira. There are some other things we need to add to the mix, though. Long before Jesus appeared to the Apostle John in a vision, telling him to write to the angel of the church at Thyatira, this city had been called Semiramis. That's the name of a semi-mythical Assyrian queen who was treated as a goddess. In her form as a deity, Semiramis was equivalent to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar who in turn was known in Phoenicia as Astarte and in Canaan as Ashtaroth. She was a goddess of fertility, motherhood, war and the moon. And in Judges 2, 13 and 3, 7, Ashtaroth's name seems to be used as a kind of shorthand to refer to all the female deities Israel turns to instead of God. And so, although Ashtaroth and Asherah are not the same, there's a link here with the worship of pagan goddesses, which made Thyatira a particularly appropriate place for the counterfeit spirit of Jezebel to manifest. There's something else, too. During the second missionary journey that took him to Philippi with Silas, Paul met Lydia a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. Acts tells us that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and she became the first recorded convert to Christianity in Europe. You know, the devil specializes in anything underhand. Wherever possible, he will use thievery, trickery and manipulation to get his way. He can't create, but he is a very well-practiced counterfeiter. Wherever God has his work and his people, Satan will try to bring in his own counterfeits. That's why Jesus warns about false Christs and false prophets and why we see counterfeit spirits like Jezebel. In Thyatira, the enemy was working to make counterfeit disciples, a counterfeit of Lydia. People who were once servants of God, but whose spiritual sensitivities were blunted by false teaching, so their religious instincts could be channeled into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. There's a very famous quote from Lord Acton, I believe, who said that all power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the same principle can be applied to false teaching. As soon as we move away from the plumb line of the complete, unadulterated word of God, we will start to go astray. And the further down this track we go, the worse it will get. The best antidote to false teaching, of course, is the truth of God's word, all of it, with nothing added and nothing taken away. In this letter, Jesus was calling his people in Thyatira back to him, urging them to repent of Jezebel's ways and warning that if they did not, I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Some of the believers in Thyatira had allowed themselves to be taken in by this Jezebel spirit. But in truth, they should not have been deceived. We can say that with absolute certainty because others amongst this congregation did not hold to Jezebel's teaching and had not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Everyone in the Thyatira Church had what was needed to stand against the enemy's infiltration, and so do we. And here is where we get to the nub of spotting 
resisting and confronting a Jezebel spirit. We should not be taken in by a pleasant guise, honeyed words or slick presentation. And we should not give way to seductive charms and promises to give us exactly what we want. As Paul observed writing his second letter to the congregation in Corinth, Satan's servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. The enemy will dangle in front of us what may seem attractive on the surface, things that look loving, tolerant, good and beautiful. But behind them will be something else entirely. We need to test everything against the word of God, to call out falsehoods by speaking the eternal truths of scripture and not to treat human reasoning as a substitute for God's ways, God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Things that are almost right and partly good mean inevitably that falsehood is mixed in with truth and God hates mixture. He doesn't compromise with evil and neither should we. We need to be alert to attempts to undermine, exploit and work through power structures, to use up proper channels of decision making and to take control through exploiting weaknesses of personality. Deception, flattery and manipulation must be seen for what they are and firmly rejected. We should be on our guard against attempts to attack, undermine, ignore, sideline or imprison the word of God and to stamp out any prophetic witness. Where false prophecy is introduced and false prophets given official sanction and help, Jezebel is likely to be at work. We need to examine what lies behind rebelliousness or arrogance, expressing themselves as a resistance to God's word and ways, a refusal to submit to godly authority, a setting oneself up in place of rightful leadership, being prepared to override established procedures or dispense with legal niceties. When Jezebel colluded with Ahab to get hold of Naboth's vineyard, legal niceties went by the board. They just grabbed and took what they wanted. This spiritual principality that goes by the name of Jezebel is powerful. And we would be well advised not to come against it directly unless God specifically tells us to do so. Even then, we need to make sure that we don't act alone, that we have good prayer support and have dealt with any issues in our lives that could allow this vengeful spirit to attack us or people around us. But we don't have to attack directly to confront this counterfeit spirit. Our weapons of spiritual warfare have divine power to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Power to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The works and stratagems of Jezebel can be exposed without having to come against this spirit principality itself. We have power and authority to use the name of Jesus to bind and to loose, to open and shut, to cancel curses, spells, enchantments and false prophecy. As guided by the Holy Spirit, we can proclaim, declare and decree God's kingdom purposes for individuals, for organisations, for churches, for cities, for governments and nations. Jesus does an extraordinary thing in this letter 
to his faithful followers at Thyatira by referring them to a messianic passage from Psalm 2. We see it in verses 26 and 27 of Revelation chapter 2. To him who overcomes, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. Jesus' promise is that we will wield and exercise the same authority he does to rule over the nations and to shatter spiritual powers and principalities. Now, of course, that is an authority that will only come to its fullness during the millennial thousand-year reign of Christ following his second coming. But it's an authority the Lord wants us to start walking in right here and now. This is the authority that will see believers in Christ triumph over the spirit of Jezebel and all other counterfeit spirits and demonic powers. God is just and true. He searches hearts and minds and repays each of us according to our deeds. He will not impose any other burden on us beyond what is strictly necessary and what we can bear. He does not rush to condemn anyone. But even with the false prophetess in Thyatira, he gave her time to repent of her immorality. Yet though he is patient in the extreme, we need to understand there comes a time when this patience is exhausted and we will reap what we have sown if we do not repent. The false prophetess in Thyatira was unwilling to repent and consequently faced God's judgment. Jesus left no doubt what was in store for her, saying, I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will strike her children dead. The end of the Jezebel in Thyatira was as gruesome as that of her Old Testament namesake, of whom Elijah prophesied, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh and Jezebel's body will be like refuse on the ground so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. That end for the historical Jezebel, for the Jezebel in Thyatira, is as grisly as the fate which awaits the counterfeit spirit of Jezebel, all other demonic entities, and ultimately Satan himself. But by contrast, to those who stay true to him, Jesus promises, I will also give him the morning star. What does that mean? Well, at the very end of the Bible, Revelation twenty-two sixteen, Jesus describes himself as the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So in saying that he will give us the morning star, he's saying that he will give us himself. What a promise and what a reward. He who has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Philip. Um, yes, let's just take a moment to reflect on how that Jezebel spirit that Philip has just described is actually manifesting in our own nation at this time. Let's ask the Lord to reveal those activities and those powers now. In government, in media, just in our day-to-day -day lives. And let's ask ourselves, are there areas 
of our own lives where we've been taken in by that spirit? Are there areas that we need to bring to the Lord now and to repent and to ask for his healing? And how can we, insignificant as we are, stand against that spirit and that malign influence in our nation today? Father God, we just bring all this before you now, the thoughts of our hearts and minds. Lord, we know that there is such a spiritual battle going on at this time. And we know how insidious and how beguiling the lies of the enemy can be. Lord, we just want to ask your forgiveness for ways that we perhaps haven't always stood firm. And Lord, we pray that more and more the wiles of the enemy, the beguilements, the lies will be exposed that people may be challenged and may be set free by you. And Lord, please use us in whatever way we can to just stand in your strength and to have fortitude and courage. And above all, Lord, to trust you that we might serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think that was a very challenging and powerful sermon from Philip just then. I think it's given us a lot of food for thought. And we come now to just this point in our service where, again, we <clears throat> declare our faith. We affirm our faith. And this is a stand against all powers of the enemy, all deceptions of the enemy, because we stand in the Lord. So let us say this together in conviction and in the strength of the Lord. We say together, we believe in the Holy Scriptures as originally given by God, divinely inspired, infallible, entirely trustworthy, and the supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. We believe in one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. We believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, his virgin birth, his sinless human life, his divine miracles, his vicarious and atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, his mediatorial work, and his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the salvation of lost and sinful man through the shed blood of Jesus Christ by faith, apart from works, and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, by whose indwelling the believer is enabled to live a holy life, to witness and work for the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the unity of the Spirit of all true believers, the Church, the body of Christ. And we believe in the resurrection of both the saved and the lost. They that are saved unto the resurrection of life, they that are lost unto the resurrection of damnation. This we believe and this we affirm. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Ian to come and lead us in our prayers this morning. Ian. Heavenly Father, we humble our hearts to come before you this morning, knowing that you are the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the everlasting Father. 
We thank you that you've given us a way to come to you as your children through the blood of your precious Son. We submit to Jesus, Son of God, our Saviour and Redeemer, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you move among us now, stir our hearts, and help us to align our will with your will. Heavenly Father, we come to you in gratitude. We're amazed you've not given up on our country when we see how our Christian faith is marginalised in our land today and how little respect and thanks you are given. We depend on your mercy to give us time to repent. Lord, in our lifetime, we've seen exponential growth in population, in wealth, in innovation, in medicine, in the lifting of people out of poverty. We live lives that in many ways are so much easier than our grandparents. We're grateful to you, Lord. We see that you provide unstintingly. You do not hold back your blessings. We do not need to fear we will run out of food or think that we must reduce the world's population. We're also to be grateful to our faithful forebears because we know that we've reaped the harvest sown by generations of faithful Christians before us. We thank you for the men and women of God whom you've used to shape our free Christian country. And we want to keep their memory and example alive in an age that is losing respect for the past. In Deuteronomy 6, you told the people of Israel to keep their faith alive in the desert and pass it on to their children. Help us to keep the faith in our generation through these spiritually dark times. May we hold fast to our faith until you come. Help us to discern where today Christian words are being twisted to ungodly meaning. We pray for your justice, mishpat in Hebrew, the right ordering of the world under you, Lord God. But today we hear justice used to mean I should have what you have got. This group should have the same as that group. The word justice is now being used to delegitimize and condemn our Christian inheritance on the pretext that some achieve more than others. We repent that so many of us have fallen for this deception. In a world of materialistic envy, we reject the call today by so many worldly leaders to worship equality as if it were God. You, Lord, give to each of us differently as you know how each of us is made, what we are made for and what we need. Help us to always lift our eyes up to you when we're tempted to envy someone else, and instead to thank you that each of us is your child, known to you by our own name, with our own set of blessings from you. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit to help us discern, at a time of such rapid and confusing change, what is good and what is harmful, what is good progress, and what is progressivism, the proud worldly belief system that is seeking to replace our Christian faith. Deliver us from deception by the evil one, O Lord. We heard in today's reading your rebuke to the church at Thyatira for tolerating those whose teaching misleads your servants, intersects your immorality. We repent that many of the leaders of the church today are not confronting false gods and ideologies, but instead are compromising and submitting to them. Thank you for the 11 bishops who recently signed a statement against the proposal to change church teaching to conform to the world's standards on same-sex marriage. We lift our faithful church leaders to you, Lord. May they have favour and influence on the church's direction. We pray you give courage to church leaders to stand up and call out the false morality that is taking hold throughout the West. Grant your favour to churches and denominations that uphold your teaching. Father God, our children's schools have been targeted by the enemy. Extremist lobby groups have managed to influence the syllabus and to instill fear of speaking up in dissent. We lift up to you those teachers who do honour you, those who try to uphold your truth 
and to point children to you. We pray that you vindicate those who are hauled before disciplinary meetings or courts. Be with those MPs like Miriam Cates and Danny Kruger who are demanding that parents have more access to information on what is being taught in relationships education. We pray that as the next election looms closer, our politicians will show less fear of Stonewall and more respect for parents' love and concern for their own children. Mighty Lord God, we ask your blessing on the commission set up by Voice for Justice on Discrimination Against Christians, CDAC. Thank you for bringing eminent people on board as patrons and commissioners. We pray that Christians who've experienced discrimination will come forward. Give wisdom and discernment to the commissioners handling the cases and guide Linda as she steers the commission. We ask for favourable publicity and that this commission will draw attention to the pressure to de-Christianise our country and that will stimulate more open debate about whether we really want to change the belief foundation of our country and to acquiesce in the closing down of religious freedom. Lord, you say, I will not abandon my people, Israel. I will rescue my people, Israel, from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. May the Israeli Defence Forces detect and repel any further attacks by Hamas. We pray for the safe rescue of kidnapped victims. Thank you that Western leaders have shown support for Israel, and we pray they may continue in support. We echo Paul's words in Romans 10. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Lord, they have zeal for you, but not knowing the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own. We pray that the few thousand Messianic Jews in Israel would increase in numbers. May your Holy Spirit open the eyes of more Israelis and lead them to a saving knowledge of you. Heavenly Father, though Israel seems far away, in the neighbouring village to where I am here in Berkshire, in Hampstead Norris, a service is taking place right now at St Mary's Church to remember the two local people, Dave and Celia Barlow, who were killed on Tuesday by Islamic terrorists in Uganda, where they were on their honeymoon on safari. Lord, be with Wayne the vicar as he ministers now your compassion to the community here. Comfort their families on their loss and may they draw closer to you, the God of all comfort. Lord, we proclaim that you are mighty and that everything is in your hands. May our delight always be in your law so that we are like trees planted by streams of water and that we may bear good fruit for you. We ask all these things, Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And let us gather together all these prayers in the words that Jesus himself taught us. Let's say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We come now to that point in our service where we are going to bring before the Lord any known to us at this time who are suffering in any way, physically, emotionally, mentally, or just facing a difficult situation. Maybe, maybe that is describing ourselves at this time too. And we ask the Lord's touch this morning, trusting in his love for us and in the power of that love. We come before a God, a God of healing, a God of love, and a God of power. So in a minute, I'm going to invite you to unmute and to speak out the names aloud for those who you wish the Lord's touch this day.
as we stand together asking for healing. So we bring to the Lord the sick and suffering, those who are heavy laden, those who mourn and grieve, those who are weary, tired, anxious. None of their needs go unnoticed by our God. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ bless and restore all those troubled in body, mind or spirit that we now name before him. prayers in the knowledge and absolute assurance that God hears us and that he is working for our wholeness, the wholeness of those we've named before him and for our blessing. Thank you. So in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ you. and by the power of the Spirit, may God in his perfect compassion restore all these we have named before him and speedily send them complete healing of soul and body. Let healing come speedily, and let us all say, Amen. So now as we come towards the end of our service, I'm going to ask Kate to uh, lead us in our final song, please. Kate. Yes, we are now at our blessing and dismissal. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you 
and give you peace mm. this day and always. And Amen. Peace. I do. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we say together, in the name of Christ, Amen.